Okay, I think we are good to go. I wanted to do something a little bit different tonight. And it's as I was giving that thought as to who we were as a class, it uh, brought up the thoughts that I wanted to share uh, with you tonight. Not just from me to you, but from Kimmy as well, since uh, we are cohorts and I'm making an assumption. And I would pretty much believe that um, each one of us are here tonight because in some way we have been called by God to preach the gospel message. And that's what we're doing. Training ourselves, whether we're furthering ourselves in the education or training ourselves in preparing for that vocation of God's call to us. And I wanted to focus on Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, and it's a story of the road to Emmaus, very familiar. It's a story that is just pregnant with a lot of information. But there's just certain information that I wanted to focus on from this particular story. Um, I will share which one of those that we are, we're, we're going to be focusing on. I'm not going to read that whole story because there's pieces of it that I want to pick up as we go along. The Gospel writer, Luke, is very... Um, He's very deliberate in what he writes. He says at the outset of his gospel that he is putting together this uh, first-hand scenario. He is gathering resources and putting it all together for you, most honorable Theophilus, so that you can be sure of what you heard. Luke gathered this information, and he went through the process of interviewing people, people that had a first-hand confrontation with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and put it here for... Uh, a confirmation of what Theophilus has heard. But even more so, as we read the Gospel of Luke, we see where he has taken these narratives and overlaid them one with another. And even in the narratives themselves, we can see and point to some particular purpose that Luke is writing, even on the small stories, the small narratives. And in this section of the story on the road to Emmaus, one of the things that I think Luke is pointing to um, not just for Theophilus, but for the very purpose of sharing what he did, um, was that if you look at the last part of chapter 24, Jesus tells them, you are witnesses of these things, and that the repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And it's to this end, with the focus on this purpose, that I want to share with you some things from this story to Emmaus. <coughs> the story begins by telling us that two people are on their way to Emmaus. It's not a geographical story with a beginning point in Jerusalem and an ending point in Emmaus. There's a particular reason for this story. You see, there's an undercurrent in this particular story. Give me a minute to catch up with my slides. Um, this story is about a journey. It's about a journey of two people that um, are on a journey of faith. Because on this journey, they're starting with the confusion and despair over the suffering, death, and the disappearance of the body of Jesus Christ. But their destination through this story is grasping the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of their <coughs> Redeemer. The underlying part of this story is a journey of faith. And so I want to look at this journey of faith and the three scenes that take place. And it's not so much that I want to share what the message is, but I would like to look at these scenarios and share how that message is <coughs> shared. And I would like to look at the how by looking at specific words that are being used by me as he shares this story. The first scene is when the two are on their way. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near. And he asked them, what is this dispute that you are having with each other? And there's three specific words there. Discussing, arguing, and dispute. And I think the key word is discussing. As they were discussing this on the way. And those other two words of arguing and dispute are words that modify, are words that point to a more complete meaning of what that word discussing has to represent. The word that the Holy Bible translates as discussing, the NIV and the RSV translate as talking. The American Standard Version translates it as communed, as they communed with one another. 
And Peterson says, as they were in deep conversation one with another. And so we ask, what is the nature of this discussing? How are they discussing it? And I can hear Cleopas now as he's on the way, traveling with his companion, and he might say something like, I, I don't get it. I don't understand this. What would they have done with the body? Why, why would they have wanted to have taken that body? This, this man, Jesus, had power and authority. He was able to just speak the word and the blind man was healed. He, he was able to just look at someone and touch them and they could stand up and walk. He healed the lame. He was able to raise the dead four days even after the person had died. He had power and authority and why would they want to kill him? Why would they want to take away this hope, this lesson that he is bringing us? Not only just why, but how? With all this power and authority. He raised the dead, but could he really have raised himself? He's gone. What would he have done with the body? So Cleopas is discussing this with his traveling companion. And in order to understand the word that's translated discussing, I think it's important to understand the words that modify that discussion. Because in verse 15, it's a word that's translated arguing. And in verse 17, it's a word that's translated dispute. So if you look at verse 15, I'm going to get back to the Greek word here. The word that's translated arguing is suzeteo, and it comes from a compound word, soon with, and zeteo, which means to endeavor, to pursue, to go after strongly. And so when those two words are put together, suzeteo, these disciples are in a discourse with each other to strongly pursue, to get to the very depths of the truth of what had happened. They were searching for the truth. And in searching for the truth, they were engaging the story that was presented to them. And if we look at disputes in verse 17, when Jesus approaches them and he says, what's this dispute that you're having? And we look at disputes sometimes as from a negative connotation, but dispute is translated from a Greek word, again a compound Greek word, antibalo, antibalate. And antibalo is a compound word. The first part of that is anti, which is against, that which is opposed, or that which is on the other side, and balo, which means to cast back and forth. So anti-balo, if you could put a picture of tennis players, one of them hits the ball across the net, the other one hits the ball back across the net. Anti-balo, and it's only used here in the New Testament, means to set words against each other, bouncing them back and forth. And so if we look at the words arguing and disputing, they're engaging the gospel. They're searching for the truth and they're bouncing this story back and forth on each other in trying to find out what that truth is. Their discussion involved a personal endeavor to obtain a truth and in that endeavor, they were personally engaging the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, trying to understand the suffering, the death, and at this point in their journey, the disappearance of the body of Jesus Christ. This was their discussion. So what does this word discussion mean? It comes from the Greek word of homileo. Homileo is only used four times in the New Testament. Homileo means to converse with in a familiar fashion, to stand on common ground with. And it's used also by Luke in Acts. And one of the examples in, in Acts chapter 20 is Paul was talking to the Ephesian elders at Troas. And he was giving a very lengthy discussion. And we know the story of how he was talking so long that one of the young men that was sitting up in the window fell asleep, fell down, hit the ground, and he died. Paul went down, prayed, the guy got up. And then Paul came back upstairs, and after he had broken bread, he conversed with them until dawn. That conversing, that homileto, he gave a very lengthy homileto that some people were saying lasted about 12 hours. But it was a familiar discourse. Homileto is where we get our word today, homily. And homily, the scholars say, some of them are saying if you use the word sermon or if you use the word homily, they're one and the same. Other scholars are arguing against that. Some of the Catholic scholars that I was reading are saying that they would prefer not to have a homily involved because a homily entails too much of a personal story within what you're telling the congregation and you shouldn't be elevating yourself. But regardless, the very nature of homily is a personal engagement with the gospel story of Jesus Christ and then sharing the story among ourselves 
and with others. The author Robert Wozniak, in his book Introduction to the Homily, stated that the early church father, Origen, he is the first one to define the word homily, and he defined it as a type of preaching that related the great events of salvation history. A homily was a mutual search by preacher and congregation, a seeking after the voice of God. So in our homily, we're personally engaging the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing it not only among ourselves, but sharing it with the congregation at a personal level. In homily, we engage the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now let's look at scene two. We know that Jesus appeared to them, asked this thing of what they were arguing about. And they were given a homily, and Cleopas probably shares a very interesting homily there in a few verses, telling what had happened in the three days. And Jesus tells them how wise, how unwise you are and slow to believe. And then in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. He interpreted for them. Now, for us to understand the word that is used and is translated for interpret, there are some modifiers that we want to look for. So, what is the nature of this word that is used and is translated as interpretation? Cleopas and his companion modify what took place in the dynamic of that interpretation a little bit later on, because we know that Jesus broke bread, and as he broke bread, uh, they recognized who he was, and then he disappeared from them. And then they said, weren't our hearts ablaze? Weren't they burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? So what they're using here as talking and explaining, go back and modify or enhance the word that is translated as Jesus was interpreting for them the things concerning himself. So talking and explaining. What are these words? Talking comes from a Greek word of laleo, and simply that word is used multiple times in the New Testament. And it just means to declare one's mind. The primary meaning of it is to utter one's self, your whole being, your thoughts, your heart, your soul. Put words to that and utter it. And the scholars tell us that the person that is writing about God, when they use this word, are referring to the utterances by which God indicates his mind and his will. So the self-revelation of God, when the risen Jesus Christ is talking to Cleopas and his companion, the very self-disclosure of the heart, will, and mind of God is being shared. The very self-disclosure of the heart and mind of God is being shared in the talking. What about the explaining? The explaining comes from a word of the anoigo. And again, it is a compound word, but it means to open thoroughly that which had been closed or hidden. That word is used eight times in the New Testament. It's a word that is used to describe the opening of a womb for the first time when the first male child was born. It's also a word that Luke uses later in Acts 7 when he's talking about Stephen and giving his sermon right before Stephen is stoned to death. He looks up into heaven and says, Behold, I see the heavens opened, the anoigo, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Heaven's opening, the very revelation of God in Jesus Christ, visible to Stephen, the Dianoigo. Again in Acts 17, Paul's in Thessalonica, and for three weeks in a row, three Sabbath days, he's reasoning with the Jews on the scriptures and explaining the Dianoigo and showing that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. He's doing the very same thing that Jesus Christ did for Cleopas and the traveling companion. So Paul was opening up and setting before them how the law, the prophets, and the songs pointed to Jesus Christ. So, when speaking what was on his heart and mind and opening to the scriptures to thoroughly explain their meaning in relationship to the Messiah, this is what Jesus did when he interpreted the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. He opened up his heart, his mind. He opened up the revelation of God. So this word interpreted, where does it come from? It's translated in the NIV as explained. It's translated in the King James Version as expounded, <coughs> interpreted. It comes from a word, 
and it's a compound Greek word, dia, meaning through. Hermenu, oh, technically messenger of God. It's where they get the word Hermes. Hermes. But the Hermenu, oh, together, is to unfold the meaning of what is said and to explain and to expound upon. The Hermenu, oh, is where we get the word hermeneutics. It's a theory and practice of the text interpretation. So Jesus Christ gave the ultimate example of interpreting the text by saying the written word is a self-revelation containing meaning throughout the law, the prophets, and the psalms. And these are all about me. They can all be said in relation to me. So we have that the gospel is engaged through the homily. We have that the gospel is explained through the hermeneutics. And then we can move on to scene three. And we're told that Emmaus is about a seven days journey from Jerusalem. And if you average, on average, walk about three miles an hour on a flat terrain, two to three hour trip to get to Emmaus. Once they got to Emmaus and they talked Jesus into staying with them, and Jesus went into the house with them, sat down and broke bread. And at the breaking of the bread, they realized who he was. That's when they disappeared. That's when it hit them. They were no more worried about the suffering, the death, and the disappearance of Christ, for now they have seen it was the Lord. What their grasp was, was in understanding what the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ had to do. They got excited. They had to go back and explain it to the apostles. They had to go back and explain it to everyone that they had left. So they got up and redid their journey to go back to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem, they didn't even get a word out before they were told by the crowd, Jesus has risen and has appeared to Peter. So in their excitement, they continued and they shared. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. They began to describe. So what's the nature of this word, to describe? It's here in verse 35, translated by Holman, they began to describe. It's translated in the NIV as related. They related this to the group. It's translated in the American Standard Version as reverse. So they rehearsed the story for the group that was there, the apostles and the disciples. This word they began to describe comes from a Greek word, exegetomai. And it's used only six times in the New Testament. Technically, it means to lead out, to go before as in leading before the mind of a person the logic that you're wanting to lay out. You put it on display. You connect the words together and you leave this before them to tell and recount a sequence of events that is going to unfold and to declare the things relating to God. Ex egetomai. In John 18, it's one of the instances that that word is used. When Jesus says, no one of John writes, no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side, He has revealed, He has ex Him, brought Him to light, led Him before, in procession, revealing who this person is. And again in Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, we know that the council was called together because they were having to deal with theories that were developing about what to do with Gentiles that were coming within the church. But the whole assembly fell silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describing ex egetomai, all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles, laying out in a very orderly, detailed, narrative fashion what it is that God had done in their lives. So in Luke 24, Cleopas and his companion began to describe, they began to rehearse this story to the other disciples and to the eleven apostles, recounting it, what had happened to him on the road. So the nature of this recounting, we know we had modifiers with the other two words, but what I find interesting is that the modifier of this word exegetomai goes back to the first word of homileto, of a homily, where the story is engaged, the gospel story is engaged, and it's expressed on a very personal level. Also, it's modified by going to that second word, so that gospel story is, is modified. What is being laid out here for us is modified by taking the right interpretation, the message of God, and getting it expressed in a fashion that logically lays it out before people to see. The Greek word translated described, exegetomai, is the word where we get exegesis. The word where we get our exegesis. 
So when we employ exegesis to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're opening up for people the salvation history of God through Jesus Christ. We're laying it out in a witnessing fashion how this salvation history not only affects our lives, but affects theirs as well. And then we're, we're pointing them to the proper response to such an offer of grace. So what do we do with this? What is our challenge? It goes back to what I think is the very purpose for telling this story. And that is, the charge that Jesus gives his disciples is a charge that's true for preachers and for us today. Repentance and forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations, and you are witnesses of these things. So through your faithful use of the tools of homily, of hermeneutics, and exegesis, through our faithful use, go and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh. Well done. Very well.